advice and opinions expressed by Dr. Grant Pichet and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Dr. Doreen Grant Pichet is the Dr. Doreen is an expert in autism. Dr. Doreen Grant Pichet. Dr. Grant Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grant Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grant Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grant Pichet is a visionary in the field of autism. Now you can ask the questions on Ask Dr. Doreen. Good morning and welcome to Ask Dr. Doreen. I'm Shannon Penrod and look who's here. It's Dr. I'm going to move my box to Kleenex. It's blocking. Good open. morning. Good morning. It's Dr. Doreen Crampuchet. And we're loving your palm tree in your background. It's beautiful. Thank and, you. and you are actually by palm trees. So uh, it's wonderful to have you. Thank you. It's lovely to be there. Well, great. Uh, and we've got a great show planned for you guys. As you know, if you watch the show, Dr. Doreen Grampiche is a true expert in the field of autism. She's been working in this field for over 45 years. I know we all want her skin genes. Uh, but uh, she has been working in this field with all kinds of individuals, uh, young babies, uh, kids, uh, teenagers, adults, senior citizens, helping them to get to the progress from things that are meaningful to them. And we're so excited to have her here. She donates this hour to answer questions for all of you from around the world. And uh, I want to say, I, I, sometimes I forget to give the, give the disclaimer, but uh, in this format, it, it is a little bit dicey, right? Because there's no possibility that any expert can give individually specific advice in this format. And a true expert needs to have, and Dr. Grampiche is the true expert, uh, needs to have eyes on the situation to be able to give individually specific advice. But so we always give the disclaimer that please write in whatever your question is, as specific as possible, so that you can listen to some of the thoughts from Dr. Grampiche, but also sometimes she asks questions back so that we can have it create a dialogue. And then you want to take whatever you learn from her and go to the expert who has eyes on the situation. Does that sound about right, Dr. Grampiche? That sounds perfect. Thank you, Shannon. For that. So thank you. And we also want everybody to know that uh, we're live right now on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, as well as a few other sites. But you can, you can be writing in right now on those platforms. We'd love to take your questions live. I'm already saying good morning to Andrea. I don't know whether, is it Andrea, Andrea, Andrea? There are so many choices. Uh, but you need to tell me at some point. Um, but we're saying good morning to you. I'm thrilled that you're here. If you want to be a part of the live dialogue, please write in on one of those platforms, or you can write in your questions directly to me, Shannon at autism-live.com, or even better, go to askdrdoreen.com and put your question in the, uh, you know, it says contact us, put your question in there. Then it goes to Marina, and Marina will follow up with you like nobody's business because Marina is better than sliced bread. And let me not forget that we're here with our wonderful, fabulous producer, Chris Desmond. How many times in the last 24 hours have we said, thank God for Chris Desmond? Um, oh, my gosh, yes. Many, many times. Many all times. the time. We love you, Chris. We absolutely do. And we love all of you. We're thrilled to be here with you guys live. And we, of course, we love Dr. Grampiche. Thank you for donating your time, Dr. Grampiche. All right. Yes. I, and I didn't say uh, that we podcast. The show is live right now, but it podcasts, and later on in the day, it'll be available as a free download wherever you get your podcasts. Please don't forget that you, you need to subscribe now to the Ask Dr. Doreen podcast. It may have been, because for the longest time, if you were subscribed to Autism Live, you got both, but now it is separate. So you must subscribe to Ask Dr. Doreen or you will stop getting your feed. There is one exception to that, which I'll tell you in a minute. Don't forget that at, when we podcast, of course, there is a cost for that, but we don't transfer that cost to you. Our sponsors are helping to defray that cost so that there is no charge for you, so please embrace our sponsors. If, however, some of you have written in and said, hey, I love that you have sponsors, but I'd really like to get the feed and without the sponsors, and I'm happy to pay for it. There is a small charge for that if you would like to do that, $5 a month. Go to glow.fm slash autism live. When you subscribe there for just $5 a month, or if you pay for the year, it comes to you even uh, less. They, they take out the charge for how often they run your card. 
Uh, if you do that, you're getting a twofer because you get Autism Live and Ask Dr. Doreen, all free of ads. It really just doesn't get better than that. Um, so please, please subscribe or uh, like us, share us, do do what you will. But Ask Dr. Doreen is now a separate podcast. So Dr. Grampiche, our, our topic for today is sensory needs, a huge topic, especially this time of year. I think when the sensory stuff around the holidays goes up, it creates uh, a very interesting dynamic. So we've got some questions that people have written in, and we've got some questions that people are writing in, and we hope to get to as many as possible. First question is kind of long. I have three children on the spectrum, and I wish the world could see just one of our days to understand how different my kids are from each other. My 11-year-old is high-functioning. He is in regular school, great grades, but he has high sensory needs. He has to have a fidget in his hands at all times or he falls apart and can't concentrate. We had to have it written into his IEP. My seven-year-old is sound sensitive. It's like normal sound is turned up to 11 for her. She wears headphones everywhere, and I worry, what is she missing out on? My youngest is four. He needs to rock constantly or be in movement. I worry about life for all of them. What happens when my 11-year-old needs to take the SATs to go to college? Are they going to let him have a fidget during the the test? Is my daughter going to be sentenced to not hearing? For my littlest, how on earth is he going to be able to go to kindergarten next year when he is incapable of being still for three seconds? I feel like I have worked hard to make our lives function, but it's all a very precarious house of cards, and I wonder what happens if I die, which I, I just want to hug this parent, because I think that's a, a lot of what parents think. Like, okay, you know, we've got this on some sort of an even keel, but what, first of all, what happens if something upsets that, and what happens if I die? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, as, as any parent will attest, it's difficult, right? And we worry about everything with our children, but especially if you're dealing with three special needs children and they each have different needs, which is, you know, so, so common in autism. Um, I, I guess, uh, first of all, I guess... Give you, giving you, as Shannon would say, an air hug because, good Lord, what you're dealing with is unique and amazing, and um, I can only imagine all the different things you worry about. But I would say, you know, you've done a, a tremendous job of managing things up to this point. Not everybody deals with as three different children with special needs. Um, and if you if you really are just concerned about kind of what will happen when you're no longer around, then like all parents, I think you have to find uh, trustees. You have to find people who are will are willing to be guardians. You have to set up uh, you know your will and make sure that things are as taken as care of taken care of as possible. Right? I mean, we never. Uh, even parents of typically developing kids, everybody always worries, and, and it's always hard to find the right person who's who's willing to say, okay, in case you're not here, I'm going to step in. And sometimes it's going to be two or three people, cousins, siblings, friends, etc., and or spouse, of course, or, uh, you know, anyone who you feel would be the right person, as they say, it takes a village. Um, And so if you can do that, because I think that does help a little bit. I I remember when my kids were young and I kind of set up a, um, I guess, a will and trust. And it was so difficult just coming to the decision of what would happen if I'm not there. Uh, is so sad and so difficult to, to choose the right people and then ask them and they agree and all of these things, right? And people change and, and relationships change. And uh, so you have to keep that updated actually because uh, your relationship with those folks might change. And as your children grow up, things change. So, but I do think it's important to do that because it does give you a little bit of a sense of relief. And then of course, going forward, 
you have to continue to build the village of people who are helping for your children right now. Um, I do want to say, you know, just in response to, well, your, your 11-year-old, uh, yes, uh, they, they will make accommodations in testing. Um, I, I guess what I want to tell you from someone who's been in the field for over 40 years, things have changed a lot and they will continue to change. So hopefully by the time your kids are adults, uh, there will be a much more acceptance and uh, many more accommodations available to our kids. Uh, you know, so not only will your 11-year-old, which I'm so glad to hear that your 11-year-old is so uh, high-functioning that they that your biggest worry is can they take their sensory fidget toy when they test for college. So that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, regarding your 7-year-old daughter, by the way, there are now headphones where you can actually uh, turn on and off the external noises. So in other words... Uh, she can actually, there, there are buttons on the, on the headphones where you can hear conversation even if you keep your headphone on. It allows you to hear some of the external noises, but it blocks the overall sounds that are coming in. So um, all the new Apple stuff is like that, and there are lots of other headphones that allow you to have either complete silence or you can hear some of it, but it's muffled. So... You know, you don't need to worry about what she's missing out. Because I do believe that headphones for a lot of our kids are very helpful. Of course, you can also go ahead and teach her uh, that when she is in conversation, let's say it would be good to remove the headphones, you know. So these are all shaping things. And by the way, in regards to sensory issues, they do change over time. Um, sometimes our kids actually become much more acclimated and comfortable with sensory input, and so as the child ages, those sensory input areas become less uh, hurtful or drastic, or, or and our kids are able to tolerate them more. Um, and then finally, regarding your four-year-old, um, you know, it's I've always found it very interesting that body rocking is a very calming thing because uh, it activates the parasympathetic nervous system. So, uh, you know, maybe you can also have a rocking chair for the four-year-old in his room and um, allow him to go there and do that so that the rest of the time his, he doesn't need to body rock as much. Um, the, you know, this is kind of like sensory integration in a sense. When we put our kids on a sensory diet, uh, in between lessons, we, put, we give them sensory activities to, to calm them down so that during the lesson they can be calmer and can pay attention. So there's a lot to do currently, but I do really recommend that you kind of start building um, that village around you if you haven't already, because this is, uh, you know, a lot to deal with for one person. Yeah. I have to say that that was the aha moment for us when Jeff was mm -hmm. little, was realizing that we weren't going to pick one person or one family. Yeah. That um, much the way people have godparents, which are supposed to be the people that oversee someone's spiritual life, we decided to have godparents for all different kinds of things in life. That I even have uh, two godparents that are just that were just responsible if anything happened to Jim and I, that they were responsible for taking Jeff to theater and cultural things. Because I did, we wanted to make sure that he had a full, yeah. we have a person that, you know, a couple that he can go to if he has legal questions. Um, yeah. We just sort of doled out. We picked, uh, you know, one family, uh, my niece and her husband, that if he needed, if he was under the age of 18 and we died, that he would go and live with them. But we had all of the financial stuff taken care of by somebody else, and we had th that he would live with them, but his actual guardian would be somebody who didn't live there. So that there was yes. always checks and balances and that, and, and it was amazing when we were only asking people, can you just take care of this aspect of his life? They were like, yeah. of course, because I'm not responsible for everything. So that there was this team of people that uh, just around him and that allowed me to sleep, um, yeah. you know, because it's, a, it's the unthinkable, um, but absolutely sending that mom a hug. Um, 
saying hello to Riding with Mike. So thrilled that you're here with us, Mike. And I want to say that Andrea uh, wrote into us. I love this. She wrote last week, Dr. Gramache, about her son not wanting to get out of the car to go into the house. And mm -hmm. you suggested to give him some sort of highly motivated reward. So yes. she is giving him two mini marshmallows when he gets in the house. And it totally works. Go. I, I love this example because sometimes we think, oh, my gosh, something highly rewarding. I'm going to have to get him, you know, this giant toy that I'm going to have to have shipped. Too many marshmallows is all it took, and now he's happy to go in the house. But she wants to know when and how do I fade this reward. Yes, perfect. And actually, it's important to fade it. Um, when you learn about reinforcement, there's – multiple different types of schedules of reinforcement, which is very, very important because in real life, we never continually get reinforced. In fact, um, I, I'm going to try not to get into a huge lecture on reinforcement and types of reinforcement, but I, there, if you maintain a continual schedule like he has right now, which means every single time he will get the marshmallows, uh, then it becomes, not only is it difficult to manage, but if you miss, let's say, two opportunities, he might just stop. Like, it's very easy for a behavior to go away if, you, if it's only maintained on a continuous schedule. So I do recommend that you fade it, but you fade it very, very slowly, and you fade it to what's called a... Um, it, it'll be kind of a random schedule on which he will, so the way you'll do it is like the next time, um, uh, you break, you tell him to come in and he doesn't get, or give him one marshmallow this time, right? And then once you've done that, go ahead for the next, I don't know, week, give him the two again. And then after a week, have him come in and don't give him any for one one time that he comes in. And then again, for let's say five days, um, go back to giving him two. So you're doing it very, very slowly, and you're doing it on a random schedule. You don't want to do it every single week. Like at the end of the week, he has a time that he comes in and he doesn't get it because it has to be random. The schedule has to be random. It can't be based on a set number. Um, and it also needs to be faded very slowly. And also you can replace with other fun activities. Like for instance, you could give him one marshmallow, but then say, hey, we're gonna do something fun together now, whatever it is, but do it slowly, fade it gradually, and he won't really, he'll, it'll be fine. So as long as you now move it to more natural things, for instance, you know, you, uh, we're going to do fun activities in the house. So, and that's kind of how you do it. And pair it all with praise, I'm guessing? Always praise, always praise. But I think the main thing is that it, these are called ratio schedules. Intermittent ratio is what it's actually called. Um, because it's not, it's based on a, a kind of a random number of times. And each time you, he's not going to get the marshmallow each time. So he will never know when he's going to get it. So he will continue to come in hoping that this is the time I get it. And eventually you can even take it down to, you know, oh, hey, we don't, we're out of marshmallows, but we'll get something else. And then you can just mix it. Yeah. Can I tell you what I call that? reinforcement schedule, I call it the slot machine. It is the slot machine. Slot machines are specifically built on intermittent ratio schedules. And they so and that's the schedule that is the hardest to break. And that's why we all sit in front of a slot machine doing this, because we think that, oh the next one is gonna be the time when I win. The next one and they're on a random schedule. Uh, saying hello also to Autism Journey with Elijah. We had them on the show yesterday, Mike and uh, Lori Bowersox. They were absolutely amazing. If you guys missed that show, you should go back and watch that. They have a new line of shirts out that are called, uh, it's the Autism Affirmation Clothing. They're so lovely with, you know, great.
great affirmative things on their shirt. It's really lovely. Everybody needs to check that out. Uh, okay, going on to our next question. Uh, my son screams whenever we get on the highway. Is that a sensory thing, and how can I change it? Currently, I try to never get on the highway with him in the car. For Thanksgiving, we went to my sister's. We drove at night on side streets until he went to sleep, and then we got on the freeway. At one point, he woke up and started screaming, and we almost wrecked the car. Sending them a hug. Yeah. Hard stuff. Uh, yeah, people don't realize how difficult these things are, you know. It is, it's, it's so difficult, right? Just so difficult because we're constantly trying to make modifications and accommodations to help our kids um, be able to tolerate what's in their day-to-day -day environment. It could be sensory. Uh, I, it's hard for me to tell because I'm not there and I don't know what else is happening, but it could be... And when we say sensory, it could be visual, it could be auditory, or it could just be fear. Um, and so you need to kind of, I guess I, what I would do is I try to figure out which one it is. And um, the way to do that is, first of all, don't avoid the freeway because whether it's, you know, it's not always going to be you. And sooner or later, he'll be exposed to being in a car on the freeway, and when he is, you need to be able to, he needs to be able to handle it, right? So instead of avoidance, try to give him the tools to handle it. Now, if it is um, a visual thing, then giving him an iPad that will distract him, and then you go on the freeway for a very short period of time, and if it's successful, you can gradually increase the duration. If it's an auditory thing, then obviously you're going to want to give him, uh, you know, noise-canceling headphones. And again, if it is successful, and I don't know his age or his level of comprehension, but you could just go in one entrance and exit the next exit so that you start with a very short thing, and then you can tell him, we're going to do two exits, and then he can count, like distract him so he knows also that we're just going for two exits, we're going for three exits, now let's see how long we can go. But you do want to give him the tool, right? So either like an iPad or you could even give him something to draw, um, maybe it is the sound that's bothering him, so the headphones, maybe give him his favorite music, um, something like that. And by the way, if it is just fear, like, if he is afraid of something, maybe the speed with which you are traveling on a freeway, then, again, getting over any kind of phobia has to do with a uh, graduated, sort of very slow exposure to the scenario paired with a calming stimulus, right? So, uh, assuming that music or watching something on his video or maybe someone sitting next to him uh, maybe holding a favorite stuffed animal, anything that is calming for him would be paired with very small uh, exposure to the freeway. And when you do, if it, if it ends up being just a phobia, um, sometimes we can just do graduated exposure through uh, visual things. Like, for instance, a picture of a car on a freeway um, is the first exposure, and then you know, a video watching a car drive on TV on the free, on the freeway, something like that, before you experience it with him in the car. But I do recommend uh, just, you know, giving him a lot of different, one by one, so that you can tell which one it is, but giving him the tools, the support, making him feel safe, making him know that there are options where he can pick up his headphones if it's the sound, he can look at his... Uh, uh, iPad or whatever else he is engaging him if it is the visual and, and work on it and you will gradually get past it um, as parents we have so much going on Shannon as you know that we end up just avoiding the situation yeah. but the sooner you work on it the better I'll be honest with you if I had another life to live I honestly think this is what I would want to do with my life is just figure these things out uh, because they're so fascinating to me 
And I have so many, I have so many questions for this mom because as you bring up, you know, is it a visual thing? Is it a sound thing? Because, um, you know, it's a very distinct thing that he's screaming on the freeway, but if they're on a side road, he's not screaming. And so, so part of me wants to know, is that when you're, because when you're going fast, I'm certainly somebody who I get car sick on a stationary bicycle. I am just like no fun on a merry-go-round. <laughs> you know what I mean? And if I didn't have a way of saying that when I was a kid, um, and there were times when I was a kid when I would say, pull over, pull over, pull over, and I would get out and cl- my mother would describe it that I would clutch the grass and I would be shaking because I would be so dizzy. So, you know, and, and I will tell you that as an adult, I have to drink ginger tea before I get on the tram at Disneyland. Mm-hmm. Because I will get car sick, but ginger tea fixes it for me. But so I yeah. wonder what. But it could, as you said, it could easily be there's a womp 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 noise when you get fast, and that sometimes our kids can hear that we can't hear. There's so many different things, but clearly, if if he's screaming, there's something, or is he remembering there's a past trauma? There's something. But I but I love the idea of trying to figure it out instead of route your life around. Yeah, for sure. Because and it, I, I, I mean, thank you for bringing that up, Shannon, and saying that he could be feeling nauseous or dizzy. Definitely, that's one option. But remember, just as likely as it is that it could be a fear or a trauma, it could also be a game. Yeah. Like sometimes, you know what I mean? Like he might be hearing sound, the wah, wah, wah sound, and actually screaming along with it because it sounds like a song to him or something like that. So we have to be open to all the possibilities. And I would, the first thing I would do is just sit in his location and list all the things that it could be uh, causing that and then go one at a time and try to figure it out. Well, you just made me think about when people are on roller coaster rides and they're going fast, what do they do? They They scream scream because it's enjoyable. Yeah. And maybe that's, you know, him. So we don't know. But I just want to know. I want to go spend yeah. two weeks, and I want to find out. But that's not my life. Okay. <laughs> not. Also, also, another thing is, let's not forget, sometimes our kids just see something and they imitate it. Yes. So I don't know what he's seen on TV. Like, maybe he has seen, I don't know, a car chase or something where he thinks, you know, it's accompanied by screaming. I'm yeah. not sure. But... But definitely trying to figure it out. I do think that some of the biggest moments when I look at all the families that I know, that that moment when they figured it out is worth everything. And avoiding it, as you said, is not the ticket. Well, because uh, it ends up being more and more and more and more. And by the time the child is like 15, you're avoiding 20 different okay. things, you know. And then it makes life just impossible for you as a parent. This is what I also tell parents who are, avoiding dealing with, let's say, the child sleeping with them at night. Yeah. And it's one thing if your child is four and you're still not dealing with it. It's a different thing if they're 18. Yeah. You know, so sooner or later, it's something you have to deal with. Uh, a parent wrote in and said that their son is six-year-old, speaks in full sentences, and is making great improvement in social interactions and academics when he's focused. But the biggest challenge is that he switches into imagination mode, and it's hard to break him out of that. They specify that the, um, this is happening in school, but that the only thing that gets, gets him out of it is his imagination mode is something exciting, stimulating, or from his special interests. So you were talking about that. I want to uh, say that they wrote in and said, I want him to be able to learn to lose himself in his imagination when it's appropriate, on the bus, in the tub, lazy Sunday afternoon, etc. But um, he doesn't get this and does it any time. So do you want to continue where you left off? Yeah. Yeah. And I guess I'll, I'll restart and I'll talk about this whole process is, is based on this kind of psychological uh, process that's called cognitive flexibility. And cognitive flexibility is when is, is something actually that's a, it's a developmental process. We learn it early in life, and he needs to uh, practice it and get better at it. And it has to do with being able to 
uh, move thoughts around in your in your mind. And it's completely fine for him to be in imagination mode. A lot of kids are, and as, as we age, we, we get less and less in imagination mode, except for those folks who are very, very creative, obviously. Um, but what you have to focus on teaching him is how to get himself out of imagination mode in environments where it's not uh, appropriate socially, right? So in the classroom, perhaps, or when you're talking to him, um, or, you know, when he has to focus and do something that's timed. There's lots of situations in life where we have to focus on something that's going on and can't be in, as you call it, imagination mode. And so I, I recommend two different things as usual. One is there's a number of activities that you can do with him um, you can certainly go to a psychologist if you want, and I would start by asking for an evaluation um, of set shifting, psychological flexibility or cognitive flexibility, set shifting. Set shifting really has to do with moving our mind around from one type of activity to another. Um, they, there are several tests that are used to evaluate whether a person has difficulty with set shifting. Uh, there's, a car, there's a test called the Wisconsin card sorting test. There's another one that's called the Stroop. A psychologist can give your child these and see if your child is able to go between two uh, cognitive sets. So two different types of thoughts like numbers and letters or uh, you know watching something and responding versus hearing something and responding. So they, they can test for that, but in the meantime, you can also do activities to strengthen that. Um, and there's a lot of activities you can do. They're listed, if you go on our skills platform, uh, Skills for Autism, which we can give you the, the URL or website for it. And you can go on there, and if you go in the section for uh, uh, cognition, or even actually in the section for executive functions, because this is a form of executive function. Um, and if you go in that curriculum area, you'll find a series of lessons that fall under flexibility. And this is one of those. This falls under mind flexibility. And it'll give you a lot of different activities and ideas for things you can do. At the same time, you know, you want to always make sure that there's, um, if there is a way for you to help your child medically, you also need to look at that. So there's a possibility. This is something that a lot of folks with ADHD struggle with, um, and it might be a good idea if you're going to see a psychologist or psychiatrist to get an evaluation for possible attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Now, I want to say people always assume that a person needs to be hyperactive in order to get that diagnosis, and that's not the case. The hyperactive version of ADHD is just one form of it. You could also have attention deficit with just inattention, which could be this. Now, um, there's nothing, I don't want you to get scared because I'm throwing a lot of names at you. It's not a scary thing, it's just practice. It's kind of like language, right? We learn language through practice. And so you can certainly do a lot of different types of activities that will uh, get his brain to move in between the cognitive shifts faster. And so that's kind of what I was explaining when we lost electricity. <laughs> there we go. Uh, speaking of which, speaking of, of ADHD and medication, um, Autism Journey with Elijah wrote in and said, I'm sorry I'm not home, and off the top of my head, I don't know the do dosage that her child takes of guanfacine for his Guanfacine. Guanfacine for ADHD. One mm -hmm. full crush tablet every morning. Is there a time where he will get used to it enough? Um, and, and then I'm not sure, but they said he needs to change, and how can the change affect him and the family with adjusting? And that they did upgrade from a half of a pill to the full dose. Yeah, so guanfacine is a non-stimulant uh, medication for ADHD. And 
it's a unique medication. It doesn't work for every child. It does sometimes, and it's usually not something that is uh, administered as the child gets older or bigger. So you might want to talk to your psychiatrist who is, um, uh, this is under their control, who is, is uh, giving you the guampacine. And if you don't see the effect of it, then uh, there are lots of other options um, which your child can, could potentially benefit from. Obviously, there are the stimulants drugs, so Ritalin, Adderall, Vyvanse, etc. But then there's also um, classes of serotonin reuptake inhibitors that work with ADHD, like Stratera. So you really should talk to your psychiatrist and they can help you uh, with these medications. It's important not to do anything sudden with any of these, like you have to fade in or fade out. So I don't really know. You might be in the phase of fading in and gradually increasing the dose and see how it continues to go for him. Now, is this the same? Because I, I, I'm not sure. That there's Is it guampacine is what you're saying? Is that the same thing that's in mucinex? No, no, no. That's that's a completely different thing. Okay. Um, guampacine is is for ADHD. It's a medication. That for, must be guampacine. Yeah. It's a very similar sounding thing. Okay. Get it? Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, sorry, sidetracked. Um, they also said that he all of a sudden has started to get uh, car sick, which is weird to us, and that now we take breaks often. That two hours seems to be the limit, and that then he gets car sick. Uh, I want to go back to, uh... You know, the car sick thing, I mean, we should, this is one of those things that is important to pay attention to, because, uh, getting dizzy or car sick a lot of times has to do with, um, the ears, and so it would be pretty important, I think, to have his ears checked, um, because sometimes it has to do with, like, uh, problems with fluid in the inner ear, so let's just make sure he doesn't have an ear infection or something like that going on. Amen to that. NJZ said, good afternoon. My son is potty trained. While at home, he always tells us when he has to go, and he goes. However, at the ABA center, he has been peeing in his pants and laughing. Uh, they go on to say it was his first time back at the center in almost a week because he was sick. I am concerned that he's doing this because he's having emotional distress at the center. How do you feel about this? Yeah, I don't know that I would. Uh, we always worry when things like that happen. I'm not sure that I would say he's having emotional distress. Um, but to me, because he's laughing after he does it, it's he's controlling the situation in a way, and he's kind of like... Um, playing, let's say, with the folks who are there. So the question really is, when he um, wets himself and laughs, what do they do? Uh, likely they are obviously either, I mean, we have to, you have to answer that for me, because it's possible that by wetting himself, it prolongs how long you stay, and maybe he wants you to stay longer. Uh, maybe they take him to the bathroom and change him, and he gets to uh, avoid doing work lessons. Uh, maybe there's something else in the bathroom that he's enjoying. Maybe he's just attention seeking. So there's a lot of stuff that could be leading to this. And I would, um, you know, you're in an ABA center, so I really would recommend that you have um, the BCBA, the supervisor who is there do a functional assessment of the behavior to figure out exactly what's controlling this behavior. A lot of times our kids do these behaviors and we're like, what is going on? And the way to figure out what is going on is always by looking at the things that are happening before and after. Um, is he getting attention? Is he getting access to something? Is he avoiding something else? Is he prolonging some activity? Those types of things are very important to look at so that you can figure out exactly what's going on. Wonderful. Esther has written in and said, My four-year-old son loves music and currently loves singing the Ants Go Marching. It's really cute. 
Uh, but he will keep singing it over and over. How do I get him to sing it just once and then stop? And then can you teach this to me? I had Green Day Basket Case playing in my head over and over and over yesterday. I couldn't get it to stop. Hey, you, I, the songs that you have had in your head lately, Shannon, I, I swear. I know. Alice Moir to Commissar. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, the thing with our kids is... Um, I think you just have, and I don't, again, this is one of those scenarios where I don't know enough about the child. My parent can tell us age and comprehension level because uh, it's, you, you basically need to have a visual for number of times so that the child is like, okay, you're allowed to sing it one time. And then you reward that, right? And you get it under what we call SD control. So if they sing it one time, they get a reward. If they continue singing it, the reward is taken away. And um, that's essentially your child getting the message that, oh, I'm allowed to do it once. But you will need to do it intermittently during the day or you will need to redirect him to some activity that involves music because clearly... He's really into the singing and the music and all that sort of stuff. So uh, clearly you need to give him that out or the ability to engage with music when it's appropriate. But when he is singing it repeatedly, you want to be able to stop him. And obviously the, you know, here's an incom- a, a task that is incompatible with singing is talking. So if you can get him to answer questions or do things that you know he can respond to vocally, that's where you go. And believe me, if you ask him a bunch of questions, he's going to stop singing because now every single time he sings, you're placing a demand on him. So again, it depends on what your child's verbal ability is. There we go. Uh, Another question that we had, our OT has us dry brushing my seven-year-old several times a day. We notice that he is calmer. Why is that? So that's great. I'm so glad that you discovered that. For some kids, that sensory input, and actually for some people, not just our kids, but a lot of us, the sensory input from dry brushing on the skin is very calming. And this is the whole thing we talk about with sensory dysregulation with our kids, their senses are dysregulated. It's just that simple. And so, um, you know, I don't know if you guys have ever had the feeling where, uh, I don't know what causes this feeling. Maybe if you have not sleeping enough or uh, if you're getting sick or those types of things and you feel like your skin's crawling. A lot of times I think our kids experience those types of sensory things, which are very disruptive if they're occurring all the time, right? So things like brushing, rolling, massages, all that kind of stuff tends to be very calming. And thank you for actually reminding me of the dry brush because right after this, I'm going to suggest it to one of our kids, one of the parents of one of my kids that I treat because he needs something like that as well and it's very likely it might calm him. And where do you get, because I've heard people talk about, oh. and I've seen them, but I don't know where you get them. Where do you get them? You can, lots of places. First of all, they're available on all the different, uh, you know, places where you buy sensory stimuli for kids on the spectrum. But so, uh, you know, I, I would imagine Stages Learning also has the all the places online where you can buy the various nooks and things for our kids, you know. But you can also buy them online just at Amazon. You can just put in a dry brush uh, because it is something that is used in in massage. Amazing. So, you know, when we're talking about sensory needs, sometimes I think it's important for us to own that we all have sensory needs. Um, For sure. And I talk way too much about myself, but, like, I would love to hear, like, what's a sensory need that you have? Um, let's see. Uh, I guess, I mean, okay, so I am one of those people that loves a good massage. So I will always go for a massage. But you know how sometimes when you go to, like, a spa and they do a massage, they'll also do a wrap? I can't handle a wrap for a minute. Like, if I am wrapped in something, I feel... 
immediately claustrophobic and need to get out. Whereas, like my husband, he loves getting a wrap. On the other hand, like I really enjoy um, a facial because I love the when like the feeling of um, what are those you know creams that are kind of rough on your skin. And oh, my husband, for instance, hates a facial. Yeah. So I think people have different sensory needs. Here's another example. Like uh, my husband, he wakes up. The first thing he does is turn on music. Right. I mean, he lives with music in the background all the time. And I think that's very calming for him. Um, for me, oh, here's, I just had an example of some sensory things that really, really, really bother me. Um, one of the things that I'm very, I'm, I have very sensitive hearing, Shannon, so like if somebody leaves the fan on in a bathroom, it seriously distracts me, it disturbs me. Like I can't focus because I can hear the fan. Yeah. And to other people, it doesn't bother them at all. So, I mean, these are some examples. I remember the first time I met Professor Ibar Lovas. Uh, the entire time we were talking, he was doing this with his pen, kind of like shaking it like that. And I was like, okay, that's like by definition, that could be a self stimulatory behavior, repetitive, yeah. you know. But we all do. We all like, uh, you know, moving your leg around when you're seated. Uh, people who like crack their knuckles. These are all like sensory input things that we do. Yeah, I, and I and I love talking about that because I want to normalize it. I know I was at a conference not too long ago, and somebody stood up and said, "What do you do when you're trying to explain to a parent that oftentimes parents will come and say, I, you know, my child is doing this repetitive behavior, and I need for you to get it to stop." That that yeah. seems to be a big thing. And, and the interesting thing is we have parents in two camps right now. Parents who say, I need you to get that sensory behavior to stop. And then parents who say, my child is doing that sensory, sensory behavior because they need to. Don't mess with it at all. And then and I would love to see everybody get somewhere in the middle where we allow kids to do what they need for sensory things, but we don't allow it to be something that prevents them from leading the rest of their lives. That's exactly right. That's You just summarized it perfectly. It's like, you know, we all kind of have to live within the rules of society to some extent, right? So, yes, our kids have more needs, and maybe they can do things. I remember, I think it was someone that I diagnosed uh, who had come to me as an adult. I remember now, yes. It was someone who actually used to work at CARD. And had come to me as at a, as an adult and had asked and said, I think I have autism. And I diagnosed him. And it was very interesting because he then divulged all this stuff to me that I didn't know where it would literally take him several hours every day because he did these routines when he got home. And these were very calming for him. And if he didn't do them, he was very dysregulated. But he was... He was asking for help to stop doing these routines because they took so long yeah. that he didn't have time for social life. Yeah. And I remember telling him, well, you gotta, you kind of have to like balance it out. And obviously, I'm really glad that you want to have a social life, but these things are also important. It's kind of like people who need more sleep yeah. or less sleep, you know. So we all kind of learn over time to do the things that help us regulate ourselves to a point where we can function in society and do okay. Yeah. Uh, really important that we talk about the sensory needs. I want to take this opportunity to thank you. We've got one more show left in this year with you. Next week, we're going to have you back in the studio, which we're really looking for. I always love the last show of the year, and we should have some fun and maybe some surprises. Um, so, oh, love that. <laughs> Yeah, I also want to say that on tomorrow's show, I kept putting you guys off about who's on Wednesday. We are doing a special Hanukkah episode tomorrow, uh, nice. and we're going to be welcoming the Asners, the Asner Paskowitz here with us. Uh, they're going to be talking about their new event because they do It's a Wonderful Life every year. Um, and this year you have a rare opportunity. If you missed any of the three years in the past, they're having an opportunity for you to rent their versions of one with um, Pete Davidson, one with uh, my um, Ted, the, who's Ted Lasso? Uh, oh, 
Jason yes. Sudeikis. And then the last one, uh, the guy who won the Oscar for The Whale. I'm having a total brain bubble. Oh, wow. Those are very impressive people. Oh, my gosh. All three of them took a turn at playing George, and you can rent any of the episodes and see there's some very funny stuff. If you uh, listened to my review last year uh, about Seth Rogen, who was great in the first act and not so great in the second act, and postulating why that might have been, uh, you can see that now. Uh, you play Clarence. You can, you can see that. You can rent that. So they're going to be here tomorrow talking about that. And their upcoming uh, Christmas event, which we have been able to donate a bunch of toys to, um, which is really wonderful. Then on Monday, we're having Dr. Jonathan Tarbox is going to be here with us live, which that hasn't happened in a month of Sundays. So that'll be really fun. And then Tuesday, it's the, the icing, the cherry on the cake. It's the whole thing. We get to have Dr. Grammy Shea back. I uh, will bring the, the, the holiday season in and out and Happy New Year and be done for the year, but then we're going to be back in January. We already have Dr. Uh, Temple Grandin going to be joining us in January, so that's going to be fun. Um, so you want to stay tuned for all of that and messages about that. But Dr. Grabuche, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank and you, Shannon, and thank you, everyone. Go back to being in the sun, please. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you, too. Bye-bye for now. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.